20 seconds. No, 20 views. Ah. We're live. We're live. So um, welcome, everybody, to this session, Level the Playfield. My name is Imogen Clark, and I'm one of the co-founders of a UK not-for-profit that's called Make Space for Girls. I'm really excited to be here, so thank you very much to Jen and the team for inviting us and doing such amazing organisation. I'm impressed. Perhaps if I start just by asking people to introduce themselves, and probably if I start actually by asking Susanna to introduce herself so that you've heard from the Make Space for, team, uh, Make Space for Girls team, and then I'll hand over to um, the team from Territory. So, Susanna. I'm Susanna Walker. I'm the other co-founder of Make Space for Girls. We are a campaigning charity that works to make parks and other public spaces as welcoming to teenage girls as they are to teenage boys. Thank you. Perhaps I could ask Isabel to introduce herself and their work. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Isabel. I am the program manager at Territory. We are a nonprofit in Chicago that practices youth empowerment and community empowerment through urban design projects. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be here with my our uniform with Sochi. I'll pass it to you. <laughs> They're matching out good. Um, good morning. I'm Sochi Hubble Fox, and um, I'm also with Territory. I'm the program development manager. So I'm helping Isabel develop the programs that she then executes. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you all about this. I've also been a youth participant of territory myself, um, so I am an alumni of the program as well. That's fantastic. Thank you. I suppose just a couple of uh, housekeeping points. If people want to drop questions into the chat, if we just use the general chat function, which I hope people are kind of familiar with, it's on the right hand side and it says chat so i'm just going to open that so if anybody wants to um drop any questions into the chat i'll try and keep an eye on that and that would be really great we'd rather use that than the q a uh function simply because it's it's harder to keep track on on two different pieces and hi to jennifer um so uh, the second thing is we're just going to very briefly show about five slides just to kind of kick off the debate but then once we've done that we really want to just have a a panel discussion about the issues that we're seeing when it comes to youth engagement and making space that feels really welcoming to young people because that's something that I think that we're we're really missing. Now I'm going to go into my system and hopefully the slides will present themselves. So Susan, if I could ask you to shout yes <laughs> when I my up, that would be fantastic. Uh, let me just see if it's going to allow me to do that. And then let me see. Can you see that? Yes, we're absolutely there. We're absolutely there. Brilliant. Okay. I mean, that is a very genuine comment from a young girl, Lily. She was 14, in answer to the very simple question is we're going to find out like what do teenage girls do in parks? What do they like about parks? So we asked Lily, and that was her response. She wasn't even going to the park. So we weren't even, you know getting her to the park to know what she liked and what she didn't like. As I say, we're a charity and we want to make our parks, wrecks, playing fields as welcoming to teenage girls as they are to teenage boys. And we're all about trying to think about these spaces differently. And we're about trying to support councils and developers to try something new, because that's kind of scary. You know, we can keep building skate parks, we can keep building movers, but if you try and do something new, that's kind of scary. But then really importantly, and this is why we're so excited to be sharing this space with Territory, it's about engaging with those hard to reach voices. It's about engaging with young people and young women about how they feel about space and what they want from their public space. Like everybody here, we're kind of dreamers. And this is what we would have as our perfect dream, a park that looks like this. You've got loads of girls, they're just having a lovely time. Those of them who want to do running are running. Those of them that just kind of want to lie around on the grass are just kind of lying around on the grass. There's stuff for them to sit in and be social and chat. There's shelter for them in case, you know, the sun gets a bit too hot. There's space for them to exercise and there's space for them to rest. And we want the girls to feel comfortable and happy. And like this is a place where they want to be. So that's our kind of dream. 
But then we have to look at reality. This is all UK specific, so it'd be really interesting to hear from other people as part of this session. What's the experience that you're getting around your way? But Glasgow, young women and girls who used parks, so these are not girls who are avoiding parks, these are actually young women and girls who are using parks. Only 20% of them felt very comfortable there. So they're in the parks, but they're not feeling great about it. Similarly, another you know reasonably sized city in the UK, talking to 10 to 17 year old girls about skating. And again, these are girls who would like to skate. They like skateboarding. 90% of them don't feel so comfortable in the skate park. And then this is uh, Nature England. It's one of our big NGOs. It's an official survey, this. They put a lot of resources into this survey. And they asked boys and girls, what stopped them, what stopped you spending more time outside last week so think back to the last seven days we're not asking you to think about ever in your life in the last seven days what made you spend less time outside and girls were almost twice as likely as boys to say other people making me feel uncomfortable so we've got a real issue here about the way that girls are simply not feeling comfortable in space and we really want to address that when we're looking at leisure spaces. So I'm going to kind of stop sharing now and perhaps uh, hand over to Isabel. I'm just going to stop this. Hand over to Isabel and ask Isabel perhaps to give us some thoughts on how territory approaches this idea of young people feeling comfortable in space. Yeah, um, thank you, first of all, for that presentation and, and sort of that grunting and surveys. I can speak from uh, my perspective. We don't have, you know, data from the US side, but we do have anecdotal stories and what we know from the teams in our program. Um, so the way that we approach this, um, I think is in several ways. The first being evaluating like that survey did how people feel like what is their relationship to these public spaces and these amenities um, and then the second part is okay now we know how you feel how can we like engage you in the process of designing a new place and also advocating for claiming your space um, and under the within the context of gender like you know what not just, you know, what about this place would make you feel comfortable, but once it's built, how can we let you know that this belongs to you? So how can you have agency over the design decisions and over the programming and over the general sort of stewardship of this place so you know, you know, once it's built, it's not going to become co-opted or dominated by men. So I think that's integrating girls in the process of making these places is key, and that's what territory does as a youth urban design nonprofit. And so, Chi, I don't know how you feel as as someone who participated in territory. If that was sort of yeah. your experience as well. Um. Yeah, I would say that it's it's difficult because territory has always given me a great view of a, a realistic view of what it's like to be a woman in the workforce which is that it's not always easy and you're not the majority by any means um and uh so you're gonna have great people like great women like our boss helen slade who um like constantly pushes everyone i feel like to be inspired to do what they want to do and stuff um but even with her influence there like she she's always working hard to make it as comfortable and inclusive of a space as possible and there have definitely been some instances where like we went to office visits and although our students are not all white men in their 60s so most of them are of color and um you know they're all teenagers um so when they ended up in that office with a bunch of white men in their 60s like we've heard this wasn't like a space that we felt comfortable or valued in um so uh i think that it, it provides a really va valuable way to look at the world as a young person to see someone trying so hard to make a better space 
but also that even with that, um, like there's always going to be hurdles and it, it's up to all of us to work together to get past those hurdles. Thank you. I mean, Suzanne, I know that one thing that um, we've been really interested in are schemes where perhaps academic institutions have worked with young people over an extended period of time to, to try and make young people, and particularly young women, feel better equipped to have these conversations about design. And I suppose I'm thinking about the LSE cities work mm -hmm. and things like that. Yes, I think there's two really interesting um, sort of aspects to this, which, re which really resonate with what Territory are saying. One is simply that we don't apply what we think teenagers want to, to the landscape rather than asking them. And that's really crucial because there was a, a, um, a very particular research project in Brent in North London. They worked with a small group of teenage girls and, 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 and boys. And initially the developers said, shall we just build a skate park? And they said, well, maybe we should actually ask the people concerned. And so instead they funded this long form consultation project, which one of the things that came out of that was people always assume that we want a skate park, but actually only one of us skateboards. It's not necessarily what we're after. So I think adults and those in power putting their preconceptions of what teenagers want is a huge problem. The other thing, and I think this particularly applies to girls, is because girls don't tend to get provided for in public space. You can't just say, hey, what do you want? Give us a shopping list that actually the longer form process is really important, as um, Isabel was saying, about working out how you feel about a space, how you want to feel, and what might get you to that place. And so inevitably, it does take time. But in the end, that consultation is really worthwhile. And people go, oh, well, consultation, it's expensive, it's difficult. But actually, if you spend the money and you build something that nobody wants, that's way more expensive. Skate parks don't come cheap. So far better to put the money into talking to the, the people who are actually going to use the facilities and find out what they want. And I think what's interesting is that while a lot of stuff that's currently provided tends to be predominantly used by boys, that when you gather a group of teenagers to get together, their what they ask for tends to be much more aligned. It's not the boys want one thing, the girls want the other. They all want spaces where they can hang out, spaces where they can feel safe, spaces that are that actually feel welcoming to them. You know, that it's the gender divide has been created, but it doesn't have to be that way. I think that's a really important point because we have seen, certainly in the UK, how gendered our teenage play space is. You know, multi-use games areas, I think you call them fence pitches, you know, those are dominated by boys in the UK and similarly in skate parks. I mean, our, our skateboard figures are 85% of skateboarders are male. And when you look at, you know, the imagery that's used in the UK around skateboarding, you would have no idea that our only Olympic skateboarders were both girls. I have to say that they had received their training in the States. They had not received their training in the UK. But, you know, the, the fact is that, you know, our, our media around the skateboard industry is very exclusive of girls. It, it, it doesn't welcome them in. And one of the questions I thought would be useful to discuss is when we're dealing with consultation and engagement, the value of engaging with girls and boys separately and girls and boys together. And I don't know territory whether you have done that kind of groups of girls talking about space, groups of boys talking about space and bringing them together. You know, what your thoughts are about that? Is it useful? Does it reinforce the gender divide? What's your thinking? Um, I think, well, I'll, I'll say something and then I'll pass it to Sachi, but in our program, funny enough, there's, I think it's more girl dominated and also just a, a sort of very LGBT, like queer LGBTQ, like gender fluid vibe in our studio as well. And I think the reason for that particularly is because we are so intentional about being inclusive in our design process, which signals mm -hmm. to the teams like, hey, this, this being in this program will be safe for me. Um, and so, 
we haven't necessarily had separate conversations. I think we will say, we're going to have this conversation on gender in public space. Is anybody interested in joining? And then whoever's interested, personally interested and invested or feels like they have the most to say or wants to share will join. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of how it's worked out so far for us. So she is there. Any fun um, experience? Yeah, I, I guess, especially from observing <laughs> our, our older groups or our more advanced studios, um, I would even say that um, the so, so everything's co-ed, um, but I feel like the girls tend to dominate the space the most in our programs. Um, they really don't take anything from the male um, participants of our programs. So um, when we are in a situation, it, it usually is our, our female um, students who are like, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> or something um so i think it's really interesting how we've managed to create a space where we we started to like flip that i don't like we have a whole group of teenagers now that like the boys don't just um make the women like girls in the groups defer to them in every single instance and i i think that like territory has been a big part of the mentality shifts that some of those boy students have had they're pretty rambunctious as teenagers are <laughs> it surprises they surprise me sometimes i think i think there's a just to amplify something that isabel said there about it being a sort of queer friendly space that one of the things that we feel very strongly is that a park that ends up being better for teenage girls is better for everybody because in fact the facilities that we're providing at the moment don't even cater for probably a majority of teenage boys, a relatively small proportion of teenagers want to either play football or skateboard. And yet somehow this has become good provision for everybody. And the, but when she listens to the good by listening to the girls, we're going to just create much more open spaces that are more welcoming and also less didactic. Because one of the things about teenage spaces is at the moment they tell you what to do, play football, do skateboarding. And Teenagers tell us that that's not what they want. They want something more interesting that they can interact with in a variety of different ways and interact with more creatively. And that's good for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just think, um, I think that's exactly what we find in territory. And one of the questions that they've started, you know, asking back to any visiting architects or design consultants that come to our studio is how do you, how has your practice fundamentally changed when you bring this sort of intergenerational feminist approach to your design? And then also how has the general community at large changed fundamentally mm -hmm. when you change your process? Yeah. This way? So exactly that. I think that's I think that's what territory seeks as well. I think one of the interesting things that we've we've touched upon a little bit is the way that we need to try and change the existing power structures that we've got, because I think you touched on this issue and you said that, you know, uh, perhaps being part of a group, a program like the, the territory has has designed, has possibly challenged some of the assumptions that some young men may have about their right to occupy space. And one of the things that we've come across in the UK is this idea of boys occupying girl uh, play spaces and girls fitting around the outside is something that they learn very early on at our we call them primary schools um so up to age 10 because the playgrounds are given over to football and there's a group of boys who will take over the space and everybody else kind of squashes around the side and we've spoken to people who said that actually Sometimes in the UK, they fear that girls leave their primary, their elementary school education, having not learned how to be play literate. They literally don't know how to play because they haven't had the opportunity to learn that in the school playground. And I don't know if that is something that you see with your school populations, that there's a kind of implicit, well, boys will be loud and boys will take up space. 
and girls will be quiet and they'll fill around the edges and they won't make too many demands, whether that's a peculiarly sort of British thing. <laughs> Well, Judy, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that's a pretty common occurrence across the world. Um, I study psychology for school, so uh, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time looking at is the social differences between boys and girls, and it's because we socialize them differently. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. I, I could, I could totally see girls. I, I don't have any like straight research on it, but I could see girls coming out of school systems without really any play literacy, especially when you consider that girls have a higher rate of using um, emotional abuse sort of as a way to gain high, like higher social standard and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I feel like that's a real, but that's quite indicative of lacking certain social skills of like just understanding like that's just not right. Um, whereas boys would be more physical with how mm. they try to hurt their peers. Um, and like that is just a clear showing of the difference in how they're socialized and what they're socialized to be told is like an okay way to treat other people. And neither one of those is an okay way to treat other people. Yeah. 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 I think this, the, to almost to flip this on his head though, that one of the things that one of the reasons why I'm involved in Make Space for Girls is that I think that occupying public space isn't just about a right to play. It's not. Just, it's about teaching girls in particular that they are part of the body politic. They are part of the community and that occupying public space is a right and something that they need to do. And at the moment, what public space tells them is that the, your girls stay at home. And I really don't like that. And I think it has huge implications for how they see they see themselves as belonging in society i think that's something that we you know we're seeing a lot of at the moment in the uk we've had a particularly horrific run of murders of young women uh mostly in london but elsewhere as well and there's an awful lot of chatter on all the social media about well the the safe thing for teenage girls to do is to stay at home and we've even had people saying to us, well, I don't know, it doesn't sound like a terribly good idea to be campaigning to create space outside for teenage girls at the moment, because like they're just not even going to be safe. You know, and you're going, no, wait, wait, look, we have safety issues here, but the answer cannot be that we say to teenage girls, I'm sorry, love, it's not safe out there, go home. You know, that cannot be the answer. But as I say, we are seeing observations being made and you know it is even you know in reality unfortunately what happens we were talking to a group who had created a teenage hub with a particular focus on teenage girls and it had to be closed because men from the surrounding community were using it to groom young girls mm. you know and, and, and we, we talk a lot about Eva Karl and the work she's done on gender mainstreaming in Vienna and saying, you know, we can't design for the world as we would like it to be. We have to design for the world as it is. Mm -hmm. But the world as it is at the moment, you know, is not welcoming to teenage girls. And we have to find ways to design and support a change to that. Um, I think, yeah, I've just just on that point of you know safety and you know I, this is something i think that's happened because of covid and take and shelter at home is we know teenage girls aren't the, the threat of violence at home is just as real as it is in public mm -hmm. and online yeah. as well like there is no nope, there isn't there's you know safety in the public realm but not everyone is safe at home and not everyone is safe online so this yeah I just, there's so many levels to like safety and feelings of safety and, and the threat of yeah. violence in public or everywhere for teenage girls is, is, is very real so like i think one other thing that you said susanna is about feeling part of community this idea like yeah 
not just public space, but how do you get to the public space? Like a lot of times we have teens coming into our studio and they'll say, on my way here, I was harassed on the bus and it was, it sucked. Like, or I was waiting for the train yeah. and somebody came up to me and was harassing me. So it's not just like the active public spaces and public parks, yeah. but all parts of our society waiting for the bus at home, online, that yeah. really did systemic change. I mean, not to catastrophize, but it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. I look, I'm conscious that we've just, we've got about four minutes left. And I, I wonder if, if everybody would just like to sort of say, a, you know, anything that they would like to say by way of a sort of closing observation in terms of, you know, making spaces that are welcoming for, for all teenagers and, you know, and particularly for teenage girls. I mean, Susanna, could I ask you just to sort of anything finally you'd like to say? I'm going to say something really positive. We're a relatively new charity in the UK, but what's been really gratifying is that the response has been incredible. You know, people are hearing about this and people really want to make a change. And we've all, I do feel that the moment has come now where spaces are going to be created and that spaces are going to be better for teenagers in general and for teenage girls in particular. Thank you. Isabel. Um, yeah, I think the answer with making spaces safe for teenage girls means integrating them throughout the entire design process. So all the design professionals here watching this stream, participating in World City, I think ask yourself, when was the last time you had like a real genu genuine conversation with a teenage girl or a group of teenage girls? And, and how does that inform your practice? You know, thinking really critically about that, I think will go a long way. And so she you. Um, yeah, and I guess like my final thought is to just spend some time reflecting on the women in your life and the girls in your life and how you're treating them and whether it's the same or fair um, in comparison to the men and boys in your life. Um, and just making sure you're keeping that in check and being conscious of how you're actually putting energy into the world in regards to that. A lot yeah. of people very unconsciously say stuff, say things that they don't really mean and stuff. So, yeah, and I think I suppose I would just like to sort of reflect back on on certainly what what you just said about um, not speaking to teenagers, Isabel, because so many adults, the only teenager they speak to is their own child, and that relationship has within itself all sorts of quite complicated things. Which means it's not necessarily, you know, a good test of what teenagers think. And so actually challenging design professionals and the people who are making decisions, because for us, it's often our borough or our district or our local council who are making decisions that design professionals then have to respond to. And so saying to design professionals, but also the people who are making the decisions within the city councils and everything, you know, when was the last time you actually spoke to a teenager, really, and listened to what they had to say as opposed to telling them things? And the other thing is just to echo what, what Suchi said about kind of changing our approach to teenagers. A lot of what you see on social media, it goes on about, oh, you know, teenagers are loitering. Teenagers are hanging about. Teenagers are causing trouble. You know, what are they doing? They shouldn't be here. Let us design them out of the space. And actually, we have to recognize that a lot of what looks like loitering to adults is actually teenage play. It is learning how to interact with your group in a you know, in an unsupervised way in your own your own autonomous realm. And I say, I think as adults, we've got to kind of get over ourselves on this one. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note of getting over ourselves, I think we've run our 30 minutes. Oops, I could stop my timer, it'd be good, wouldn't it? Um, and um, I, think, I think I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody. And if anybody has any questions, I'm sure that from... Um, we make space for girls in the territory will be very happy to to answer them. <laughs>